In your Bibles, we'd like to turn to James chapter 4. We're going through a series looking at some of the teaching that James brought to the early church. James chapter 4. Uh, I'm going to be basing what I'm saying on verses 1 to 10. Give you a moment to find that. I shall be referring to those verses as, as I speak. I'm going to ask a question to which I should know the answer. Who needs God's grace today? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and that grace is God's free, unmerited help and favour. It's a free gift to sustain us and get us through life. Take verse 6. I'm going to read it from the message. This is what it says. It's common knowledge that God goes against the willfully proud, but God gives grace to the willing humble. Verse 10, same translation, says, Get down on your knees before the Lord. It's the only way you're going to get on your feet. That's good, isn't it? Get down on your knees before the Lord. It's the only way you're going to get on your feet. So this morning, I, I want you to leave from this meeting feeling encouraged, uh, inspired, lifted up. Um, but James's message does come does come uh, cloaked in very strong and blunt language. So uh, previously, we've heard the teaching about this two kinds of wisdom, and it finished by saying that the peacemakers, this is chapter 3, verse 6, 18, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. And that's, we're called to be peacemakers. But then he immediately goes on to talk about, but what causes fights and quarrels amongst you? I thought we were peacemakers. But obviously there's some fights and quarrels going on. I didn't have them at home. I had to go outside uh, to the shops and bought them. Bought a packet of licorice all sorts. And they were... You don't like them. You like them. You see, that's exactly... You, some like them, some hate them. That's exactly the reaction I wanted. Uh, because um, I, I like them, but I do not like those blue ones. The aniseed. Oh, no, you see. <laughs> so I've got a split congress. Some people like them, some they don't. Now... When you're reading James, you come across verses say, hey, I like that. Then you read something, say, I don't like that. And that's exactly what is happening here. James is talking about peacemakers, uh, grace being available. But then he's immediately saying, but as a church, you're quarreling and fighting. What on earth's going on here? Alec Moiter, who was commenting on James's letter, says this. I'm going to read the paragraph. It might be illuminating to some people here. When born again as a Christian, you're born into a battle. Christians, though we are, our old self battles against the spirit of God residing in us. The new birth, becoming a Christian, does not solve the conflict. In fact, the new birth brings us into conflict, where the old nature and the new nature battle it out. So if you're a Christian, you're not yet made perfect. We're having to deal with the old nature, which would like to dominate, and the Spirit of God, who is trying to recreate within us the character of Jesus. So James is writing to uh, Christians scattered around uh, the, the, the whole countries around, where, around uh, Jerusalem, Israel. And the Christian faith is very, relatively new. James is one of the earliest letters written to Christians. So these are people who have come out of uh, pagan belief, uh, worshipping other gods. They found Jesus. Maybe some of them were Jews and they've come to recognize that Jesus is the Messiah promised. And now they're having to learn a whole new way of life. But they've still got their old habits and their old ways. And it's so easy to revert to that. So he's saying, church, you should be sowing peace 
into the church, into your community, into your workplace, into the world. And we know for today how much peacemakers are needed. The evidence of conflict around the world in so many spheres of society is getting greater. And Christians are called to sow peace into society. But he's saying, I've noticed there's quarrels and fights going on amongst you. Now, there's some very difficult words and phrases in, in this, these 10 verses. Uh, when we select who's going to preach, I said, oh, well, I'll do that one. I wish I hadn't now. <laughs> there's some very difficult verses. He says, you might know if you scan down there, he says to these Christians, you kill. What? Are Christians killing? Uh, later on, he, he quotes from Scripture. He says, why does Scripture say? Nobody knows what Scripture he's quoting. What's James on about? And then he talks about um, the, the God envying about the spirit within us. Is that Holy Spirit with a big S? Or is it my spirit, what makes me me? And there's, we're not doing a Bible study this morning. We could take an hour just analysing those three verses. I'm not here to do a Bible study. You can do that at home. If you're, I know some of you like doing Bible studies. There's a job for you. Sort that out. Um, but I'm here to tell you that the main thrust of what James is saying. Let me read. What causes fights and quarrels amongst you? Don't, you? don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. Well, let me just take that very difficult word where he's saying to the Christians in this angry situation you kill and covet now some commenters say oh no he can't be <laughs> he can't be saying that James can't be saying Christians are killing each other <laughs> oh no that's never happened hmm <laughs> some people say actually it's a mistranslation it should be you envy and covet which ties in later with he uses the same word And if we've got an idolised picture of the New Testament, um, some people say, oh, we'd like to go back to New Testament Christianity. Well, we want to go back to New Testament teaching. If you read the letters in the New Testament, the church sounded a bit of a mess, to be honest. <laughs> they, they were sort of, communion was chaos. There were people showing off with their gifts. There were false teachers. There were rivalry groups going on. That's why most of the New Testament was lit, written to sort out <laughs> this early church. And James is, has somebody given him a report? You know, some Christian communities, they're not getting on very well. Has he heard something? Well, he gives us a nub of it. You want something and you can't get it. So you get this angry, you get this possessive grabbing. You quarrel and fight. Do you know the phrase, you go at it hammer and tongs. <laughs> and, and, and in that uh, heated argument, you're talking and you're not listening. Now, on Friday night, they're doing a Bible study on Proverbs. Well, I'm reading through Proverbs as well at the moment. In Proverbs 10, it says this, lots of wisdom in Proverbs. When words are many, sin is not absent. But they who hold their tongue are wise. <laughs> hold your tongue. Don't keep going on and on. Listen before you talk. But this quarrelling and fighting, because I want something, I want something, I want sin. And he says, it's come to this killing. Or maybe it's, you're just being strongly envious. Um, maybe it's that sense, you know, I could kill for. <laughs> you know, I could kill for. I, I, I would take any action to get what I want. 
But here I'm now getting very serious. It actually does happen. Christians have killed. I can't give you the whole story, but I personally know someone who was a, a, a preacher, a meeting leader, who when anger and resentment and jealousy rose, they actually killed somebody in their family. And that's not unique. Do you remember the story of David and Bathsheba? who was a man after God's own heart. But he wanted something that he shouldn't have. So in the end, end wanting Bathsheba for himself, he tried quite, quite a few other plans, but in the end, he planned to have Bathsheba's husband killed. Now that takes us right back to Genesis, where Cain killed Abel because of jealousy, because he, his nose was put out of joint, because he was angry with God. He wanted something that wasn't his. And a very timely word that God gives to Cain, he says, sin is crouching at your door and you must master it. Why? Because if you don't master it, what will happen? It will master you. And it started in that seed thought of jealousy and envy and anger and if it's not dealt with there, if it's not nipped in the bud, it may lead to consequences that we wish had never happened. And that's true. That's an extremity in, in murder. But we know people get angry and events happen which we thought, oh, I wish it never happened. Churches fall out. They split. Christians won't talk to each other. We know it happens in the business world that things that started off just as a giving in to a small temptation escalate and then you've got a national scandal. I don't know if you have phrases in your Christian experience which stick in your mind. I've got one from years ago and I, I, I can't find the source of it. But uh, I listened to a sermon and the, the preacher was talking about characters in the Old Testament. And... Um, the phrase he used was, the uncontrolled passions of a gifted man. And the uncontrolled passions of a gifted man can be his downfall. Sadly, this year in the National Church, we've seen that. People brought disgrace on the name of Jesus and on the church. We see, we've seen it only this past week in business. People who were high-profile earners actually be found guilty of gross crime. We find it in politics, don't we? Uncontrolled passions that very gifted, but in the end, it undermines the foundation and is the ruin and the fall. So James is using very abrupt, very stark language here. You think, oh, that's a bit, that's a bit more, but. What he's saying is, if you don't deal with it in the seed, actually the full, well, instead of a harvest of righteousness, the harvest of evil, of wickedness, of dissent, of discord, might come. That strong word, you kill. Well, John, who was called the beloved disciple, he says something equally, goodness me, what language is he using? 1 John chapter 3, verse 15, I'm quoting from the Bible. He says, anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. What? Actually, that seed of hatred where, out of my face, get out of my face, get out of my life. I wish you weren't here. You're actually trying to eliminate that person, which is, well, you wish they were dead. Oh. And then he says, you do not have because you didn't ask God. <laughs> you tried to sort it out yourself. Instead of going to God with your feeling of anger, or your feeling of nose put out of joint, with a feeling of, oh, being set aside, what others have preferred, your, the, the feeling of, 
I, I need this, God, and it's, it's not happening. Why is it not happening? So you try and sort it out yourself. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, says this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, what should you do? Present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard It will guard your heart and your mind. It will be the doorkeeper so that you don't, as we pray, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. Bring it to God. The peace of God will be a guard on your heart and mind. But then James has said, oh, well, actually, you do pray, but you're praying with selfish ambition. It, you're praying so that it's all about you. So that he says you can spend your, your, what you get on, your, on, on yourself, on your pleasures. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. And that is the, the attitude of the world which he warns us against. Where, you, you must be aware of it, the world, which is that which is opposed to the ways of God, is all about me. Making more money for me. Having a more comfortable lifestyle, having greater pleasure, having, you know, I, I know people who work all week just to go on, or work all year just to go on holiday. Because that's ambition. I, I just need, it's about me, me time. And when God blesses us, if he gives you more, why has he done that? Why has he given us more? More money, more energy. He's given us health. He's given us a nice house. He's given us talents and abilities. Why has he given us so much more? So that we can give to others. So we can be a blessing. We can bring God's rich blessing to other people. James, he hasn't quite finished yet. <laughs> he says, you adulterous people. Okay, oh, it's like being in a ring, isn't it? And you're getting <laughs> thumped everywhere. <laughs> he's had a real go at us, and now he's saying, you adulterous people, because the hearts have wandered away from God. And he says, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. That was exactly the temptation Jesus faced in the wilderness. The devil came to him and said, I can give you everything you want if you worship me. But be adopting the, the values, the attitudes, the standards of the world, actually he's becoming an enemy opposed to God. And what Jesus had to do was to reject the temptation of the world and come close to his father and find the real, the full satisfaction that comes there. But the danger is that living in the world, we get soaked in their attitudes. We see the adverts. Our friends talk to us in, in certain ways. We had testimony last week uh, from Becky that in her workplace, she had decided one course of action. People were saying to, him, uh, to her, if you do this, it actually will be better for us. And Becky had to decide, do I do it God's way or do, do I do it the world's way? And that's why he comes to, to say this, this verse. I'm not going to analyse it. Just give you the substance of it. Verse 5. Or do you think scripture says without reason that the spirit he calls to live in us envies intensely? In your Bible, we might have footnotes, but it gives us various translations of what we think uh, James was trying to say. Was it the Holy Spirit in us, which is giving us that upward call, uh, delivering us from evil and temptation and calling us in God's way? Is that spirit which is working, envying in us? Is it... <laughs> God saying, the life I gave you, the person you are, I don't want you to be like that. I want you to be like Jesus. And he's envying, he's calling us to be like himself.
whenever we stand at that crossroads of temptation, that is when we know this battle going on. Do I do it the world's way? Do I do it the way I've always done it? Do I do the, the path of unrighteousness, of sin? I've got that choice. It was Elijah the prophet who, stu- who said to the people, you stand at the crossroads and you, c- you have a choice. You can go that way or you can go that way. And in that moment of temptation, we know the devil and our own nature is calling us in that way. But there is a spirit of God within us as believers who is calling us to godliness. And that's God being jealous for you. He doesn't want to lose you. It's like Hosea. His wife went off and committed adultery. The covenant love Hosea had for his wife wanted her back. And when we stray into the path of sin, the covenant love of God, he doesn't reject us. He wants us back. He's jealous. He's envious for us. And so not only does he want us, but he says, I can make it possible for you to be a friend of mine. Because he says, the scripture says, God opposes the proud. If, if we're too proud to ask for help, you're on your own. But he gives grace to the humble. He gives grace. When we say, God, I can't do this. It's beyond my ability and beyond my strength. Then we have the grace of God, which comes to us through Jesus Christ, who faced temptation in a way that we could never imagine. He was tempted in every way to a greater degree, yet never sinned. And so his grace, his help by the Spirit comes in and he says, actually, you can. You can live a godly life. Other commentators have said, and we say it often here, for us as Christians, there's never an excuse which says, I couldn't help it. Yes, we could. Yes, we could. We chose. That's why James says, submit yourselves to God. That's not something God is going to make you do. Submit to me. It's something we choose to do. I submit myself to him. Resist the devil. That means turning away from what we know is wrong. And that in some situations can be a very tough decision. We have people in the congregation who have struggled with addiction and know in that moment when everything is calling within you to go down that path again, you have to stand your ground and go the other way. And we have power and ability to do that. Hallelujah! Submit, resist the devil... And then there's this, come near to me, come near to God. Just run to him as a, as a child to the father when they're in distress. Come near to me. And what does it say? <laughs> He'll run faster to you than you could ever run to him. And you'll find grace to help in time of need some translations say of that verse where he says gives grace to the humble he gives greater grace more grace than you will need there's never a deficiency in there's a oh well if only god did more there is more available than we ever need and more and, and sufficient what god said to paul in his tr- struggles my grace is sufficient for you And his grace is there to keep us faithful to the path that we've chosen to go. His grace is there to deal with that that testing moment in the moment of temptation. To have one of the lovely fruits of the Spirit, and we need it more and more, a spirit of self-control. Who needs a spirit of self-control? Absolutely. Absolutely. And God can give us a spirit. Yes, you can. Spirit of self-control. And then in the moments of conflict, when the arguments are going on, instead of inflaming the situation, we can actually be a peacemaker and sow into that conflict peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. And as Matt was talking uh, the other week, 
to have wisdom to know how to be a peacemaker. So we sang earlier in the meeting, my one desire. And I know, I know for many people here, that is their one desire. It's what Paul says, the good I want to do, I find I can't do, and the bad, it's still struggling there. But if that is our heart's desire, my heart's desire is to be like Jesus, there's greater grace available. And he says, so wash your hands. Purify your heart. Do something about it. Don't let your feet or your eyes lead you into the path of temptation. Listen to Fiona's teaching from the other Sunday. Control your tongue. Keep silent instead of shouting your mouth off all the time. Control your tongue. Purify your heart. Set your heart on what the things of God, whatever is good, whatever is lovely, whatever is ever of good report, set your mind on those. Let me finish. You can pick a copy up in the, uh, on the counter there. Um, pick one up in... Uh, the other day so there's a there's a new guide to Wisbeach and there's a map inside uh, for people new to the town there's a free map of Wisbeach there which gives you the streets I was interested the churches in Wisbeach are marked with a little black cross so St Peter's St Augustine's do you know on the map they've marked the Queen Mary with a cross so on the map we're marked as this building is marked as a church no it's not it's a community centre I was talking to somebody in another local church and they were talking about how th their building has got such potential. Well, as a church, we don't have a building because we don't think church is a building. The church meets in this building and you're marked as a church because you mark, meet here. If people want to find a church... They can look and they can go to St. Peter's, St. Augustine's, the Salvation Army, whatever. But if people want to find a church, they don't necessarily have to come Sunday morning. They should find a church wherever you live. It may not be known, but my house, Fiona, my house, on Google Maps, our house is marked as a church because <laughs> some of the correspondence for the church comes to us so Google have marked, marked the King's Church in, in the Clarkson Avenue but it should be the mark wherever we are at work, social, private, home that we're marked out as the people of God who are people who are filled with the grace of God so in all situations and at all times, as Paul says to the Philippians, you'll be shining like stars. So I begin, I, I end. No, shall I do it all again? No, I'm, I'll end. Who needs God's grace? Who needs God's grace? Just to, to resist the devil? To live like Jesus? I know I do. And if, as we're sharing coffee, fellowship together, if you would like time to pray with somebody, we don't do a lot of public ministry out the front. Uh, we do at times, but we don't do it that often. But if this morning something that we've sung, something that I've shared has really touched with you, find somebody you trust to pray with you. Instead of spending 50 minutes just nattering, just draw close to God. Come near to him and you'll find that he comes near to you. So that so James was writing to people who were living in a, in a very uh, unchristian world and they were scattered all over. And he was concerned that the, the church was becoming like the world. Whereas actually in the world we should be different and we should be transfer, transforming the world. And there is grace sufficient to do that. I'm going to pray and then we're going to have coffee together.
Lord, thank you for your word, which is, um, it, it is like this sword that gets to the heart of the issue. And it does expose wrong motives and wrong actions and wrong thoughts. But thank you, it also is the, the, the promise of life that we have in, in you, Jesus, and the word that you've given us. Everything we need for life and godliness. So we pray as we live through uh, this coming week, and we will face temptation. We will face the, the, the words and the actions of people, ungodly people. We're, we're, we might even be confronted by the activities of Satan or demons or whatever. Thank you that you've given us grace to be more than conquerors, to be overcomers, that we don't have to be like that. We can be Christians living the life of Jesus. So thank you for this grace, which is sufficient for every, every need. Thank you that you're a God who you say, if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You don't keep a record of wrongs, but you do encourage us to go on this upward journey to be transformed more and more into the likeness of Jesus. So we pray your help for us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.